If we look at basal perissodactyls, such as Eohippus and Heracotherium from about 52 to 55 million years ago, shortly after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, we see that they still had five toes on each of their four limbs. On the inside of each forelimb was a small thumb or dew claw. Each of the remaining toes was equipped with a small proto-hoof somewhat resembling a pachyderm-like padded hoof in which only the very tips of the toes had the hard keratinous covering. On each of the hind limbs, however, only the three innermost of the five toes actually made contact with the ground and were tipped in this hard keratinous covering, forming the probably padded three-toed proto-hoof of these animals. The remaining two toes, the innermost and outermost toe on each of the hind limbs, the big toe and the pinky toe, if you'd like to call them that, were extremely reduced and did not make contact with the ground. Heracotherium was probably an early member of the Paleotheridae, which is the family ancestral to modern-day rhinoceroses and tapirs. Relatives of Heracotherium, for example the aforementioned Eohippus and Propaleotherium, are generally considered early equids, although Propaleotherium is not considered a direct ancestor to modern-day horses, Eohippus is a, a contender for that role. Of course, all these creatures were very similar to one another, and some would probably prefer to put all three creatures, uh, Propaleotherium, Heracotherium, and Eohippus, and any other creatures similar to them. Eurohippus. Lophiotherium. Et cetera, um, within the same clad, the Paleotheridae, which would be, under this scheme, ancestral to the horses and rhinoceroses and tapirs. So um, this, this mainly has to do with whether or not you consider rhinoceroses and tapirs to have shared a more recent common ancestor than they do with horses, or whether all three are more or less as related to one another. That, that hasn't been quite worked out yet to anybody's, um, or to a unanimous degree of satisfaction, or anywhere near it. And although various species of the genus Eohippus would continue to thrive for another 20 million years, or until about 30 to 35 million years ago, very early on some of them branched off, grew taller, had longer slender legs, longer faces, and by about 50 million years ago, we'd gotten Orohippus. Although Orohippus still wasn't all that different from Eohippus in its outward form, most of the evolutionary change that had taken place there had to do with the reduction of the premolars and increasing efficiency of the grinding ability of its teeth. Um, it was slowly evolving to handle rougher foods. This evolutionary trend toward greater grinding ability in the teeth would continue for another 3 million years, until by 47 million years ago, Orohippus had given rise to Epihippus.